Okay, if everyone can get settled, we're uh, a wee bit uh, behind time. So, <coughs> <coughs> pardon me, dry throat from too many airplanes. Uh, now we're going to start uh, plenary four. Uh, oh, by the way, I should introduce myself. I'm the moderator. My name is uh, Gunhild Hogensen Jörv from uh, the Arctic University of Norway, which is in Tromsø. And uh, I will be the moderator for Plenary for Climate and Environmental Change, Natural Resource Development and Gender. We have <coughs> <coughs> sorry, three speakers and three panelists. Uh, and uh, I think we'll just go in the order of appearance on the, uh, on the program. And um, the bios, I'm just going to do this quick. The bios are online. So if you want to know who you're listening to, look them up. Uh, <laughs> otherwise, uh, we will start with uh, Auder Ingelsdotter from uh, Bifrost University. Please come on up. Good afternoon. Thank you for all still staying here in the last panel of a, of a long day. And thank you to the organizers for, for, for uh, having me here. Uh, I've titled uh, my talk, who is moving this? <laughs> who, who, is, who is in charge of the slides? <laughs> I'd like to go to the front slide again, please. <laughs> It's still back, one back. Can I do it myself? Okay, perfect, I'm in control now. So, so I've titled my talk, Climate Change in the Arctic, The Relevance of Feminism. And I just want to briefly tell you before I dive into the actual talk, how I came into this topic. Uh, my background is in international relations. And from that, uh, I, I uh, became interested in climate change and I was working on climate change related issues for several years, both uh, as an academic and then later in the Ministry for Environment uh, and also with an NGO, uh, sort of from the political perspective and policy perspective and so on. And then I took a, a sort of a detour for a few years and I was working abroad with the Icelandic Crisis Response uh, Unit, which is a, a subdivision of the Foreign Ministry, where, where I, in, I went, among other things, to the Balkans and I was working as a gender advisor for UNIFEP, which is now UN Women. And about the time when I was there, I, I see within UNIFEM this theme popping up again and again, gender and climate change. And I was sort of very confused in the beginning because I'm thinking, well, I know a lot about climate change. I've been working with that for a long time. And I do know a few things about gender equality. I, I don't see the link. Uh, well, what, what are they talking about? Uh, so I became kind of uh, uh, curious and, and wanted to explore what are those links? Uh, and this ended up actually then being my main research after I came back home, decided to go for my PhD studies and go back into academia. And uh, when I started looking at, at this, and those, those of you that have been looking at, at gender and climate change uh, probably have seen the same thing, that very quickly when you start reviewing the literature and so on, there are sort of three themes that emerge as, as what are the links between gender and climate change. And the first one, uh, which is kind of the most common theme actually, is will climate change impact men and women differently? And mostly you see this in, in relationship to developing work and you know, Africa and women and men there and so on. Uh, but also in the Arctic to some degree impacts on indigenous groups and so on. So basically the question is here, who will suffer the consequences? And we need gender analysis of that. The second theme has to do with do men and women play different roles with respect to emission and mitigation measures? In other words, who's responsible for the problem? And there are, are different types of research on that. This, for instance, relates to um, transportation patterns. Men tend to drive more cars and women maybe take the train or the bus or drive smaller cars. Uh, this can also relate to consumption patterns, uh, like who eats more meat, these kind of things that can influence emissions. Uh, and this research is more focused on the developed world. Industrialized countries, there are some, there's quite a bit of research from the Nordic countries on this. Uh, and then the third theme uh, has more to do with 
participation in policy? Will men and women come up with different types of solutions if both are involved? Does it matter that we have both men and women figuring out how we're going to, going to solve this problem? Um, somehow when I was looking at this, I, I wanted to try to go a bit beyond those three themes. Uh, and uh, there were some questions that were really sort of in my mind that I wanted to uh, the big question I had is, why are we not dealing with this problem? We know we have a problem. We, we've known for the past 20, 30 years, and we're just not dealing with it. And somehow through, through exploring feminism in, in, a, in a more symbolic uh, way, I, I started to come up with some ideas that made sense to me. <laughs> we'll see if it makes sense to anyone else. It's a little bit tricky to try to uh, talk about something that's somewhat abstract in a, in a very, very short presentation like this, but, but I'm going to try. Uh, so I'm working more with gender, sort of the symbolic meaning of gender uh, and related concepts. And the concepts that I'm mostly working with have to do with the values, feminine and masculine values, and how that influences how we talk about things and then how that influences policy. Now, when I'm t I want to emphasize when I'm talking about feminine and masculine values, I'm not talking about that all women have feminine values and all males have masculine values. Uh, thankfully, we are much more diverse as human beings than that. Uh, but, but the feminine values have been throughout history for cultural and other reasons associated with femininity and via versa. And it's important, uh, I think it's important to use these terms rather than some other kinds of terms because part of the problems we've had sort of with the imbalance in the world in terms of discrimination is we have devalued the feminine. And I think that's a problem in this discussion about climate change uh, as well. So it's, it's looking at gender as a, in, in this symbolic meaning, uh, to examine power relations and how we are prioritizing issues when we're making decisions. Now, how does that really uh, manifest in Arctic discussion when we're talking about the Arctic and climate change? And the way I've been uh, approaching this is to look at discourses. How are we talking about the Arctic and, uh, and how are we talking about the Arctic in context with climate change? And if we just go take a step back in the beginning, uh, sort of Arctic historically, if you start to look at how, how we have discussed the Arctic in the past, uh, it is actually quite easy to see a sort of a gendered uh, uh, the discourses are colored by gendered themes. We have the brave explorers that are, that are uh, exploring, that, that are sort of going to these new frontiers, discovering new land. Uh, and this is a quote from Fridtjof Nansen, one of the most famous Arctic explorers. He was also a pacifist, uh, really wor working on, on, on sort of peace and, and, and so on. So, so this comment comes from that. True civilization will not have been reached until all nations see that it's nobler to conquer nature than to conquer each other. And I thought the reason I find this interesting is, well, that's good that he doesn't think we should conquer each other, but why should we conquer nature? Is nature there only for us to exploit and conquer? Or could we view nature differently than that? Uh, so, so, so behind this is this idea that we have the Arctic explorer, he's brave, he's strong, he's discovering new untouched territories, and then the, we have the Arctic and the nature, which is sort of feminized in a way, almost virgin-like, to be concurred. And I wrote an article a few, few uh, years back, a short one, for a magazine, Nordic magazine called Nick. Some of you are probably familiar with that, where I was discussing some of the, those ideas. And um, the editor, he had an artist draw a picture uh, to sort of go with the article. Uh, and when I, and he, this is not in consul consultation with me. And then I got, got the magazine and I got a total shock <laughs> because this was the picture. I was like, what? <laughs> is that what I was writing about? But then I kept looking at it and looking at it and... and, and in a way, I guess it really represents what I was trying to say, sort of in a more symbolic way. Uh, the woman, that's the, she's representing the nature here, almost virgin-like, uh, and then in the background are the men that are, that are trying to concur her. Um, now, this is the past. What about today? 
and the discussion today. And I think we can, if we look at the discussion about the Arctic today, we can also see sort of uh, the dis discourses being colored by gendered themes. And on one hand, we can say we have what I categorize here as somewhat masculine discourses, uh, which is really f emphasizing this uh, increasingly important geopolitical role of the Arctic. Uh, and the story, the sort of narrative in this discourse is the melting of the ice will lead to more utilization of natural resources. And then coming from that is, oh, are we going to cooperate on that or, or will it be conflict? Is, is there going to be a competition about those resources? How are we going to use them and so on? Not if we are going to use them, but how are we going to use them? Uh, and then we also have another discourse that, that could be sort of categorized as, as more feminine, which is more thinking about the nature, more thinking about the po potential threats. How could this influence humans? Uh, who, are mo who are the most vulnerable populations? Uh, and so on. Uh, and uh, so I, I was curious about sort of the, the um, relationship between those discourses. Is, is one more mainstream than the other? It's one more dominating when we are creating policy and when we're talking about those things than, than the other. Uh, and I, I think one answer is it depends where you are. I recently just, fi I fi just finished teaching a course on Arctic politics at Bivrest University. I had 40 students, half of them were Icelandic, but one third from Europe and then a few from Asia. And they had a totally different view depending on where they came from. So the Icelanders were very surprised to find out there were some threats. They thought it was all about opportunities. That's the discourse we have here. For those that are not following and just get the media, that's how, how they, uh, that's a message they get. The Europeans are very surprised to hear there were any opportunities. They had only heard about the climate change danger discourse. <laughs> and the Asians were like, the Arctic? Is that a region? Why? I didn't know there was anything important going on there. <laughs> and, and we are interested in that from Singapore? I had no idea. <laughs> So, so that was a lesson for me. But, but from that, these are some of the questions that, I, that have been uh, sort of, that have come out of, of looking at those, those uh, uh, the, the, dis the discussion from this perspective. And I think, well, at least here in this region, the masculine discourse seems to be quite dominant, uh, in particular at the high political level where decisions are being made. Uh, but I want to, what I'm curious to know is to what, how strong is the counter discourse? Uh, and is there a role here, is there room for more sort of what I call feminine perspectives in addressing the, cha the challenges related to climate change? Uh, and because those feminine values, they, they are nice values, we all like them, but we kind of put them in a box. We should use them in the schools with the children and in, in our families, but do they have a role in geopoliti geopolitics? That's kind of what, what I'm interested in too to find out. And in trying to trace that question, somehow uh, I, I always come back to this, what some have called, labeled the Arctic paradox. That's because that's an area where this tension becomes very sort of clear. Uh, and this is the story of climate change. You've all heard this in, in some form or another. Climate change is going to make oil and gas resources in the Arctic more accessible. Uh, and then, of course, we're going to use those resources. It's going to bring us economic, uh, economic opportunities, right? But the problem is, utilizing those resources is going to make the problem even larger. Uh, and what, what was, has been very puzzling to me in the research I've been doing is to find out that to even say aloud, okay, to, to even suggest aloud, um, would it be possible to choose not to use those resources? That's almost not allowed to say. It's, it's like our, our, our um, the dominant values in society that a resource is there to exploit for us humans is so strong, you're not almost allowed to suggest something else. And when you look at the, the facts related to climate change, well, this is kind of a problem. We have to discuss how we're going to do this. Um, and, 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 uh, there are, of course, a lot more things that I, I could say about this, but I, I, I just want to get this idea out there that I think part of the problem is how we, as humans, view nature and our relationship with nature. Uh, that we just, this, this assumption that it's only there for us to exploit. 
rather than some sort of partnership, we, we, we need each other kind of thing. Uh, so I've been looking into this idea of ecofeminism here, uh, where they're looking in the same way as, as we've had discrimination against women, uh, sort of, uh, uh, there's a parallel to how humans have dominated nature. And can we somehow use some methods to, to, to change that and change our values? Uh, and uh, yeah, I don't think I have time to explain this uh, further here, but, but this is an important idea in, in how, my, how I am approaching this. So just sort of in the end, because I do think this has great potential if we can somehow bring what I call feminist ideas or feminist values more into the discussion. If we can look at this uh, more from uh, uh, how, how can we enter into a partnership with nature to deal with this problem of climate change. And I think in the Arctic it's interesting because on one hand we have this very masculine discourse, uh, but then on the other hand we do have um, the Nordic countries that are known for the gender equality uh, policies and being strong there. We have uh, indigenous communities that, that have had some very strong leaders and among them female leaders that have been bringing attention to, the danger, to these issues and the danger of climate change. So we have, we have some seeds here that could act or sort of as a counterbalance. Uh, but is it strong enough to really influence the, the, the decisions that are made at the end of the day? That, that, that's the question I'm... I'm I'm uh, struggling with here because I do think it's very important. We need to, to have more balance in those perspectives. So I'm just going to end with this slide here. And thank you. Thank you very much, Audir. Um and a couple of questions for you to ponder on that uh, was interested in what you were, uh, were talking about. Um, when you said that the Nordic countries had some sort of like feminine cultures, wouldn't mind if you expanded on that. Because sometimes, I mean, coming from Norway, not so feminine all the time, particularly in foreign uh, politics. Um, and also, how do we define more specifically uh, masculine and feminine values? And, if we start deconstructing them and unpacking them, maybe they don't become so precise for us any longer. Anyways, um, that's what you can think about while, and also while you're listening uh, to uh, Lilia Vinokurova, I hope I didn't mash your name up, <laughs> uh, who will be talking about the social impact of climate change and gender relations in rural communities of Yakutia. So thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, dear colleagues, I am Lilia Vinakurova. <laughs> I work at the Institute of uh, Humanities and uh, uh, Aboriginal Studies of the North in, the, in Yakutsk, uh, the Republic of Saha Yakutia, the Russian Federation. I study, you know, I, oh, I'm sorry, <laughs> I'm some neighbors. Uh, I apologize for the opportunity to speak here today, and I apologize for my English, but I will oh, try to do my best. <laughs> I study problems of uh, development and sustainability of uh, Yakutian rural communities, and the gender aspects of uh, Yakutian social history is the subject of my special interest. This is my presentation. Uh, uh, continues the work started in 2000s and uh, it is based on the materials collected in the rural regions of Yakutia uh, since 2001 to 2014. With my colleague I collected uh, uh, statistical, uh, sociological, and visual data uh, in the Virchayansky, Alukminsky, and the other northern and central regions of Yakutia. Uh, yes, uh -huh. this slide shows uh, some details of my data collection. And you see, uh, here is a 
uh, I collected with my colleagues some of materials for this uh, presentation. As you know, uh, Yakutia is the um, uh, largest uh, Arctic region of the Russian Federation, and uh, the major part of its territory still remains rural. And the indigenous Arctic and northern nations uh, living there preserve their traditional uh, mode of life. And uh, this slide uh, shows the ethnic structure of Yakutia's population. Uh, uh, as you can see in this slide, Yakutia is uh, rich in water resources. Uh, the, um, uh, there are thousands of uh, lakes and rivers. Most of the population resides within the basins of uh, major rivers such as Lena, Kaluma, Vilui, Aldan. And uh, since most of the communities are located in forested areas uh, uh, along riversides, and riverbanks and um, communities are exposed to the potential disasters such as floods and wildfires. Uh, you see, uh, they are located in the riverbanks. And uh, this slide uh, shows, uh, presents data on occurrence of floods. Uh, you see, since 2001, uh, two, uh, 2014, and the next slide shows um, flood losses in Yakutia for uh, this period. And oh, so I am sorry, and I uh, uh, I noted the earlier period uh, since 1990. Uh, 2013, and you see flood loss in Yakutia only for five years uh, grew uh, five times. And uh, I'd like to uh, note uh, 2001 was an outlier because the flood in that year affected a major town, Lensk. But otherwise, the trend uh, uh, is towards increasing economic impact. Therefore, uh, there is a need for studies that identify social impacts of climate change changes on rural communities. Oh, so, uh, sorry. In recent years, sustainability of rural communities in Yakutia has been closely associated with uh, natural climate uh, changes. As we note, residents of rural communities actually admit the fact of global climate change. But uh, it's very interesting. Uh, despite implicit and explicit hazards of natural disasters, problems of climate change are not their top priority. Uh, all this is due to uh, various social and economic problems specific for Russia and Yakutia with its severe climatic conditions. Uh, so uh, I would like to present some results of my, uh, oh, so, uh, my some observations uh, made uh, for rural settlements of Yakutia, and I. Uh, I have to note the population of Yakutia is near one million, and only a third part of its population lives in rural area. Uh, and uh, this, sli this slide shows the share of men and uh, women in uh, the population of Yakutia. You see uh, women prevail uh, over uh, the republic and in rural uh, areas too. It's, um, uh, it's very interesting because for a long time, uh, Yakutia's population uh, had uh, male face. You know, in the uh, regions with, uh, of mining industry, and uh, um, this uh, disproportion of population in men and female is a new phenomenon. And it be, uh, had become in 19, in early 1990s. And so uh, you can see age groups in rural Yakutia, as usually everywhere over Yakutia, uh, women prevail in old age groups. Uh, 
Uh, based on our observation, we know there is a clear shift in traditional uh, gender roles in rural communities. And uh, men now uh, are more likely to attempt uh, to preserve what remains the old way of life, and uh, uh, they seem to more traditionally, more than uh, women, and uh, it is um, national holidays, you see, and men uh, prefer their rural lives in the ancestral places, and they preserve and keep um, the traditional occupations, and uh, uh, they like, as uh, in uh, old times, to be in hunters, fishers, and in one of the villages, they say to me, we have been hunters and land owners here for ages, and we would, and we would like to preserve our lifestyle for years and maybe and for uh, next ages, centuries. And so what about uh, is, uh, <laughs> some uh, traditional works in the villages in Yakutia. And what about women? Um, it's very interesting. While women are more likely to explore new role, it's a traditional role, <laughs> yeah. and uh, um, both in employment and lifestyle, it seems to me uh, uh, there is a um, real gender behavior shift happening in, in rural communities with sexes assuming behavior models previously associated with the opposite sex, uh, in, uh, I mean in traditional society. Uh, and uh, one of the characteristics of this ongoing shift is um, rural women are taking an increasingly active role in economic life uh, starting, starting uh, for instance, uh, their own small business in rural area, and um, starting uh, to take more prominent roles in local governments, in municipal uh, authorities, and um, in non-government organizations. Yes, maybe the are changing, and uh, it's very interesting, but however, traditional models are not gone and uh, manifest themselves in various situations. Return to the traditional roles in most prominently displayed during emergencies. During floods and wildfires, men return to their traditional roles of protectors and providers while women preserve their families. Uh, the new reality during the emergency and the, during the um, floods, life on the roof, on the house. And uh, uh, in the study area, we collected the data on activities of the population at the time of disasters. So we have the following pictures. And it's very interesting. Uh, men are engaged in traditional work, work of rural males. They evacuate women and children, rescue and protect property and possessions, evacuate cattle, remove ma pets, organize monitoring of the situation to secure public safety. And uh, following disaster, events. Many in Yakutian villages perform search for livestock and make an inventory of uh, cattle and other property, check and repair buildings and fences. Usually, men organize, uh, uh, organize meetings to mobilize people for work. Uh, women take care of children and elderly. Uh, help in evacuation of possessions, uh, cook for their families, neighbors, and refugees, and uh, volunteers during the disasters. And uh, 
Uh, after the disasters, um, uh, women take part in uh, making an inventory of property and participate in meetings to mobilize the public. Women initiate the uh, social charity work and uh, summon meetings with local authorities. So women and teenagers uh, remove, uh, remove uh, debris from the streets and um, repair uh, whole house furniture and belongs because there are uh, many uh, work for them. Here on the slide you can see uh, aftermath uh, of a flood, as you can see. Uh, there is a lot of cleanup that need to be done the losses and uh, the picture of aftermath of the floods in the rural communities. And so um, here on this slide you can see uh, this uh -huh, impact of the climate uh, changes on a local, uh, uh, on local natural environment is more uh, profoundly and uh, in more detail observed by those members of, uh, of the communities who spend more uh, time outdoors, uh, predominantly by men who frequently raise concerns over the future of their lifestyle. Uh, rural males who having household uh, continue to keep close contact with nature, uh, but hunters and fishers House uh, uh, horse breeders and cattle herders have become a minority in rural areas, and this process has been going on for a long time. Uh, so, uh, in the villages, in modern villages of Yakutia, rural women, although more economically active, are physically more isolated within the household and are less aware of the climate change impact. Rural women are increasingly engaged in offices, more employed, employed in non-traditional areas, and including service, service jobs. Uh, and what about um, uh, the adaptation attempts? Uh, you know, the collapse of the Soviet farming system has resulted in high rural unemployment everywhere. Uh, and uh, currently, outward migration remains high. Uh, so let's move on the slide and uh, presenting reactions and assessment of rural residents on flood impacts on traditional economy and uh, mode of life in rural uh, Yakutia. Uh, Proprietary inform, uh, information based on local uh, opinion polls. Uh, and uh, the diagrams show the gender uh, migration behavior of rural residents, varies by age groups and social status. Uh, I have noted young and educated women and men uh, have better chance uh, to succeed in a new environment. Frequently, a natural disaster serves, uh, serves as a catalyst for relocation, particularly among young families, 20s to mid-30s, uh, especially those who obtained some financial aid. And uh, uh, what about uh, age groups, uh, some, elder, some older? Age group of uh, 14, uh, 13, 5 and uh, 14, 5s appear to be more established within the existing community and um, seems to be less mobile and have more existing commitments. They are likely to move only if offered a sub substantial increase in income and standards of, of living. People of elder age bracket um, uh, find uh, it more challenging to abandon established house, uh, households and their existing social status within the community. 
and uh, men are more commonly concerning, uh, concerned about maintaining their social status and um, uh, reluctant to move, while uh, women seem to be more open to be challenged. Uh, but it seems to me uh, women in that are motivated more um, by the desire to help their children and uh, uh, their um, families. Another observation here is that, ah, uh, yes, uh -huh. they are thinking about the future of rural, com of their rural communities. And uh, another observation uh, here is that men of the uh, older, older age groups uh, express more concerns over the health impact of relocations due to various relocations related stress factors. Yes, I have one minute. Yes. Uh -huh. <laughs> And um, uh, for rural seniors who have spent most of their lives in communi community, the very thought of relocation seems impossible, uh, particularly uh, if it's their ancestral village. Uh, they do not intend to leave their villages uh, under any circumstance. And ongoing uh, gender uh, changes in rural uh, communities in Yakutia is only the part of uh, many complex uh, processes happening with the rural communities of Yakutia. Uh, the fact that it's currently um, coincide uh, with the climate change only adds to the complexity. We have uh, got inward and outward migration in the Republic. We have changing ethnic structure of the population. We have the third wave in, of in industrialization and urbanization. And we have on, and, uh, only highlighted a few points about gender changes happening uh, against uh, this backdrop. And uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Lilia. Uh, and a couple of questions for you as well. One thing that uh, I thought of when you were talking about the emergencies that men and women uh, go to their traditional roles, I was wondering if uh, Lilia was mentioning <laughs> about your speech and about um, in that when you're talking about the traditional roles, whether there is a sense of inequality in those roles or with whether or not it was just a division of labor but still a very sort of felt like an equal division of labor. And the second question I had was, uh, you mentioned mining ever so briefly. Uh, I was interested in what sort of role extractive industries in the region uh, may play on um, the development of gender roles and, and people's um, uh, yeah, thoughts for the future. Birna uh, Bragadotir from Reykjavik Energy is yes. next. Hello. Thanks. Hi, my name is Birna Bradadóttir and I work as a talent manager um, at Reykjavik Energy. It's a great privilege to get the opportunity to be here today. Well, um, what I would like to talk to you, or talk to you about today is uh, the gender equality within our organization, which is one of the, one of the largest energy company in, in, in Iceland. And we have been focusing on gender equality for quite some Sometime, but as some of you know, that uh, the energy industry is a very male-dominant industry, uh, and I will, I'm going to just tell you a bit about uh, the issues that we are focusing on right now. Um, we have about four, uh, we have 420 pr uh, employees within the organization. These are like four companies that that uh, are under that umbrella. 30% uh, are women, and most of them are working in this service sector or the support departments. And very few are working um, within the core of the organization, that is the utilities and the power plants. 70% uh, of the employees are men, uh, but we have made a quite good progress in, in, in women in the leadership rule roles because now we have 
43%, and it it's actually has been growing for the, we had last year 42%, so today we have 43%. And we have actually a general manager and two of the direct, two of the four directors uh, of the utilities is a woman. And all, uh, all of the boards of the subsidiaries are 50-50% uh, men and women. Uh, we had, <clears throat> We had also have some success with uh, raising the numbers of women as engineers and technicians. It has raised over the last 10 years from 3% to 24% while the, while the industry average industry is now 80%. Uh, so we have now uh, a great role models within the organization, but we have, but our next challenge is we can't just stop stop there because uh, the next challenge is that today we only have like 5% or less than 5% of women working as industrial worker. And when we are advertising uh, these jobs, we ha hardly have any applicants applying for these jobs. It seems that the industrial work is not that attractive, especially for young women. Uh, we need, as an organization, to broaden our talent pool and educate, especially young women, about the work and the opportunities. Uh, st the studies have shown that employment satisfaction is higher when we have mixed workplaces. And we have started a project now to educate and increase the role of women in industrial, industrial and techni technical jobs within the organization. And we really want to educate women on pros and cons on working in the energy in industry and that hopefully some of them will look at the industry as a possibility to work in the future. Uh, there is also some old image of, the, of these jobs that, is, uh, that no longer applies. Uh, we really want to give them an insight themselves so they can choose as well from a bigger pool. Uh, I'm going to tell you a bit about what we are actually doing now. Uh, we have uh, yeah, uh, founded a steering group that is supported by our CEO, and we are increasing uh, the in internship program about 50%, and for, uh, or half of it will be specially just marked for women. We are reviewing our equal opportunity policy uh, for all of our uh, subsidiary companies with that has some of them have a bit different focus so we want to uh, help help with that uh, we are now preparing the organizational culture and our working environment for more women in in this in these uh, jobs and we are actually working right now with a gender experts that is taking qualitative interview with our employees uh, on the working environment through the glasses of gender. And this, this person is also analyzing our current data processes, regulation, and et cetera, because we want to know where we stand and where to focus, where our focus should be, so we can move forward. And our goal is to prepare the culture for women working in a typical, like, male, male jobs. Uh, we need to find out where we start. Where, where we need to find out where where to start working on and training and educate our current employees and adapt the culture and the environment to women, not vice versa. Today we have we have started started working with a school in our close environment, and next year we will be offering an elective course for young people at the age of 15 to 16 years old for the whole winter. We will, we will separate the classes, take girls specially and boys specially, where we will be in, introducing industrial jobs uh, within the utility and power plants, among with other important issues like safety and environmental issues. Uh, we want to do our best to eliminate these cliches about this kind of education and work and, <clears throat> and introduce them to the work within the organization. Uh, to prepare the course, we are uh, taking 100, 100 school children each month uh, to get 
to visit us uh, four times this, this winter just to educate them about the program. Um, we are educating and, our, and training our employees to, for the project because we know that they have a strong influential power of whether this, our, this work will be attractive and that the woman, women that will start working will actually stay with us. We are also analyzing our recruitment processes uh, and, and asking us the questions if we are just putting too much value on, it, on experience when we are recruiting. Uh, and one thing that we also done this spring was to uh, shorten the working day for the industrial jobs so that uh, the work will be more attractive to women as, as, of course, men. Because we are hearing every day that, that young men, they want to stay home and be able to yeah, drive, them, drive the children to kindergarten or pick them up. So it's not just for the women. Uh, we think that gender equality is an investment in the future for our business. Our mission is to attract talented people of both gender to our workplace, and we need to have talent pool of both genders. We want to be proactive and start and see how far we can reach. The most important is that the project, we think that the most important about the project is that it, it, it is supported by the CEO and all general managers. So that the gender equality is put on the table and on the organization and we are and the organization is willing to invest time and resources to well to develop further talent and we also wish that other organizations in our industry will come along and our experience is that support and willingness to change is the key thank you Thank you very much, Virna. Um, I think in, in that case, it was very interesting what the uh, interviews will come out yeah, with the result yeah. of a, a, essentially what are the attitudes mm -hmm. towards uh, this type of industry for, for women. And, mm. Exactly. Um, I've already posed some questions to our, uh, our speakers, uh, but I was thinking that maybe we could add a couple of more uh, in case there are already questions in the audience. If not, you can go hop into the questions I've already posed. But is there anyone who at the moment have some burning issues that they wish to raise or discuss uh, in the context of this particular panel? Come on, someone must be burning up there. Hmm? Okay, well, continue to sort of uh, smolder a little bit, get up to burning level. Uh, I know it's like the last panel, so no one's burning for anything. But, uh, <clears throat> but it was a very interesting panel, and I was wondering if I could start with Audir then, uh, if you recall the questions I, I asked you um, on the, when you gave your presentation, unless you need me to repeat. No, I remember them. Because they were difficult, that's why I remember them. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> well, that's good. So I've been, oh, how am I going to answer that? But uh, one thing you, you, were, you were asking about was the sort of uh, my referral to the Nordic countries having more feminine cultures and what that really meant. Yeah, that's meant. interesting. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think, I mean, on one hand, we see, I think we just had yesterday <coughs> this uh, gender gap index where the five Nordic countries are sort of in, the, in the top five uh, places. And you hear this all the time. Uh, even like when I was working for Unifem, I didn't need to establish myself as an expert. I was from the Nordics and that was enough, which is <laughs> crazy, but th that, that's a reputation that the Nordics have. Uh, and then, well, is there any substance to that? Um, I, I think I have seen some, some research where there is some substance to that, in particular in social policy. But what I've been thinking a lot about in terms of my topic is that uh, I think one of the problems is that we sort of confine those feminine uh, uh, values or qualities and so on to a very small box, something that belongs to the home or the private sphere. In the Nordics, we managed to expand that into social policy and so on, but I still think there are big areas also in the Nordics where it's not been expanded to. And, you know, Birna was talking about the energy industry being very male-dominated. When we had the banking crisis in Iceland, you know, the banking sector was very male dominated. And so, so there are certain spheres of society, often where there all the money is and the power and so on, that we still haven't 
Um, so, yeah, what I'm trying to say is, I think we can see signs of the Nordics having a more feminine cultures than many other places, but that does not mean that it has reached all the different sectors. So there's still a lot of space to, to, to work with that further. If I can just like a comment for, for a sec, because uh, what, what I was thinking of, I guess it's my international relations background. So I'm thinking uh, Norway's enthusiasm for bombing the mm -hmm off of Libya. Uh, that, that presented a less than stereotypical feminine side to Norway. And also the enthusiasm for in extractive industries. Mm -hmm. uh, in, in fact, that's, uh, there's a certain uh, yeah, and, yeah, enthusiasm for, for conquering nature still. Maybe trying to conquer nature with a few more environmental regulations, but nevertheless, that, that conquering aspect is there. So it's that dichotomy, I think, is kind of interesting. So. Yeah, yeah. Hmm. You have that image, but that doesn't mean you always live up to it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the, the, the second question you had, I, I might not go that far into it, because I know we don't have much time, but... Uh, you were asking about this feminine and masculine values and how do you define them. And, if, and, and you're right, they're very slippery concept because they are constructed concepts and they change with time, they change depending on where you are. Culturally loaded, yeah. Um, so in some ways it's very tricky to work with them. Uh, but I, I think there was a slide here, I think it was Rasmus Ole, he had this slide of, he had been doing some research about what girls and boys were saying in certain situations where it was basically I and we. That is sort of maybe a certain core in terms of where I see the, the, the difference of this sort of individualistic self-interest in, uh, that has been linked to masculinity and that is underlying a lot of our theories of how we see our world, how we see our economic systems and so on. And then the more inclusive kind of approach that thankfully is part of us as humans, but we sort of take out of the equations when we are doing our policy, and I think we need to put it back in there. Okay. Cool, thanks. Um, anyone burning yet? Anyone? No? Then I'm gonna move on to Lilia. Um, I don't know if you recall the questions I, I asked you about your presentation, and I might just add, in a week and a half, I'm going to, I can't pronounce it right, Ner Yungri. In south of Yakutsk, oh. Ner, Ner Yungri. You know Yakutsk? Uh, I don't say it right. Uh, yeah. Yungri is far from Yakutsk. Is it uh, Yungri is situated in southern Yakutia? Okay, uh, but I'm going there. I have no yeah. Situation in yeah, no, I understand. Yes. Yeah, I, I realize that, but you yeah. gave me a little bit of a, a taste of what I'm heading towards because I've never been in, in that region. But I was wondering about the, the division of labor that you framed, uh, particularly under emergencies, and you said men and women go to their traditional roles. But how are those traditional roles perceived? Are they perceived as equal between men and women, or is there a, um, uh, <laughs> a value placed on there where women's traditional roles are somehow lesser than men's traditional roles? I was wondering if you could say something about that. Uh -huh. Um, thank you. It's a very interesting question uh, because it's a uh, very sophisticated issue. Uh, the traditional roles of uh, males or, and females are changing for a long time. And it seems to me uh, in two last decades, uh, the traditional roles in gender sphere are very changed. Mm -hmm. And um, I had... Uh, currently the presentation um, on the materials of Alaska. And it's very interesting because if, uh, 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 in your uh, presentation, I see the women keep uh, their traditional knowledge and uh, close contacts with nature. And in case of Yakutia, uh, on my observations, uh, Imho, uh, women so fast lose traditional uh, patterns mm -hmm. uh, in their behavior. And uh, maybe it's very um, asymmetric. Asymm asymmetric, mm -hmm. asymmetric behavior. And in part of um, sphere, men uh, lose uh, traditional roles maybe more fast, more and uh, uh, in some cases, women lost more 
and you see, and maybe uh, traditional roles of male and females are preserved in rural areas only. Rural area areas okay. only. And in uh, urban settlements, I see traditional roles are losing or very quickly. Yeah. And could you say something about the introduction of extractive industries? There's mining in, this, in these areas you've been looking at, is that correct? You said there was mining or some form of extractive industry taking place in the regions that you were analyzing? Uh, so I have noted the mining areas in Yakutia um, oh, is a specific um, territory. Has it, has it and impacted the apparently yeah. situation. Yeah. yeah. Because rural traditions habited by uh, indigenous peoples and uh, mm. in mining industries territories, uh, population is more uh, multinational. Okay. And uh, the migrants are prevail here, and uh, the share of Aboriginal populations is very low. Oh yeah, okay. Yeah, uh -huh. okay. and it's the uh, gender patterns of behavior and gender roles in here is uh, very uh, different. Yeah, right. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And um, Shari. Uh, so just to, to you talking about that, I was interested in the strength of the women in the community that you're living in and the relationship between their interest in, in building up strength and, and tackling whatever comes on and any concerns about, I mean, is it just a question we're strong enough, we adapt to everything, it's just a question of adaptation or are there some concerns that there's certain things we will not be able to continue in the future because of climate change? <coughs> Yeah, I mean, the, yeah, there's definitely, like, that worry that, you know, of the pace of the change and yes. there might be, like, risk. Yeah, I, I really want to be respectful of the time. Oh, yeah. um, so I'm not going to go on, but how about, yes. Yes, okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, right. um, yeah, there, I mean, it's, it's, there's definitely things that uh, people are concerned about, but I think overwhelmingly just the community that I happen to be in more and more, and um, I can give other examples, there's just that real willingness um, to not think about it in that way, but just focus on being strong and, and as much as, as they can. But um, people are fading, so I, I don't want to go on. <laughs> and we're getting the... Yeah. Okay, well then we'll, uh, we'll do this, but I'll take advantage and take, uh, take some of your issues up tomorrow in the panels that... I'm in, so because it was very interesting. Thank you very much to all of you. Just a few words. I, I want to thank you for the day. It has been a very interesting day. And I just want to remind you that there is a dinner at 7 o'clock, 19 hours, at the Kea Hotel. I hope you know where it is. If you don't, just ask me. So thank you. And